All right, there we go. Thanks. Um, so I think that that first happened on, I believe it was on Saturday. Um, and then because the burn chain had already advanced past that block height, I think the follower was just stuck in a restart loop from that point on uh, because it was trying to catch up, detect that uh, the block height has already passed its exit at configured height and it would, it would exit. So the DevOps team made a change yesterday to fix that. And since then, I think once the follower caught up, it's been running fine. Then I think last night we um, had another issue where the Bitcoin D pod or the Bitcoin pod restarted. Um, and this is the same issue that had happened before. We ran out of disk space. Uh, we had added more disks. So instead of 50 gigabytes, it has 150 gigabytes. But apparently even that's not enough um, with debug logs. It sounds a bit fishy to me um, that we're filling up so much disk so quickly, even with debug logs enabled. Uh, but at least the termination reason from a Kubernetes standpoint is clear that it's low on ephemeral storage and, and that's why um, it restarted the, the pod. So um, we're trying to get some monitoring and alerting around available disk space um, so we can actually watch it and, and alert on it. So the DevOps team is working on that. Uh, but for, for the time being, the network is stalled and it has been stalled since um, I think 8 p.m. last night. Um, so. So I think after this meeting, we probably need to um, do a chain reset. Um, so, so that's where we are. But I think the chain got to 7,000 some blocks, which is the longest that has ever been. Um, so that's, that's good. Um, any questions, comments? On any of these? Um, do we know why it ran out of disk? Like, is it Bitcoin D that's running out of disk space or? That's the suspicion. Um, yeah, for some reason we haven't been, or at least I have, I still haven't seen like a very clear explanation of where disk is going um, and how fast things are growing. Is it mostly just log files? Is it chain state um, or something else? And I mean, that pod is running both Bitcoin D and the Bitcoin controller, but still, I mean, it's, it's mostly the Bitcoin, Bitcoin D container that's taking up the logs. Um, it has anyone run like DU on <laughs> that container? Uh, I haven't. Uh, I would hope that the DevOps team has, but I haven't. <laughs> but yeah, we, we just need to, to, to yeah, get on there. And, and presumably, at least my understanding is that um, Docker should be, if, even if it's not compressing the logs, it should be do, rotating the logs that eventually show up on the underlying VM that then get shipped off to um, you know, in, in this case, via fluent D into Elasticsearch. Um, and so I would like to see like, how big do those log files get in a day? Uh, I just feel like we don't, just don't have enough visibility um, into that right now. I think that we might be doing something weird where we're like catting logs to the file system and then also sending them out to fluent D so that we have mm. just like log files. I see, um, I see. Okay. I would be amazed if that took up 150 gigs in the space of a week, though. Yeah, five days. Not even a full I week. mean, it's not out of the question, but like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you guys have ideas, feel free to chime in in the DevOps channel um, to to or just poke around the the container just to see what's going on. But I agree. Like, even with debug logs, it it seems fishy to me that we're filling up this so quickly. So. Um, regardless, I think uh, we'll end up doing a chain reset soon. So um, if you guys can help figuring out what happened, um, let's do that. And then we'll do a chain reset in the next hour or two. Right, Ludo, we do need a chain reset, right? There's no, no auto recovery. And since the network has been solved for, I guess like at this point, 15 hours, it doesn't make sense to wait for that. Yeah, I think we can reset soon. Okay. All right. Um, and if you do have any other agenda items, please add in here. Otherwise, I'm running through our usual agenda. We'll review the board. Um, and then time permitting, I want to just talk about um, our plan for, you know, the POX implementation um, and just kind of talk a little bit about, you know, how we're feeling about the, um, the timelines. I know we discussed a bunch of the work around the refactoring um, in the, the Wednesday or Thursday Wednesday meetings. Um, so just want to follow up on that conversation. Um, see what the next step there should be. Okay, so coming to the board. Um, 
we'll just start with the, the review column here. The cylinder view. Is this Marsh? Uh, I think that's still in review. I don't think it's. Is there any like blocking feedback there that you need to address? Are you just waiting on reviews from? Folks? Yeah, just waiting on reviews. I guess I can uh, I can explicitly tag people for reviews on there. Yeah, I think this is a fairly small PR, so so people have yeah. time to review this. Let's get this merged. Thanks. I didn't even realize I was supposed to review that because it wasn't tagged. Um. And then I think Aaron had a PR out for this late last week. Um, I don't know if people have had a chance to, to review that yet. There's been some back and forth um, on this issue. Like at yeah. least within this team, like are we all feeling good about where we stand? Then I, I can interject to like kill some of the bike shedding that's going on. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's like, I think that it is correct that we should also be doing literal inference, um, but it's it, it's just not the case that like we can get rid of all type annotation on literals. Mm. Um, so I don't know. I, I, and I think that he is free to admit that, but I I think that uh, he just he's just uh, trying to continue to needle us until we get the type inference implemented. So I think it's fine. Like if there's a PR that implements the type inference, like I think yeah. he'll be satisfied by that. So I don't know. Okay. All right. So hopefully folks can and review this PR as well. And then Ludo, I just saw you pushed a potential fix for this. Like are you like, do you have a good hypothesis? I know you mentioned that you're verifying the fix. Uh, yes, that does not use issue here. Uh, so I was using a U16 for encoding the bug highs. Um, so yeah, there's a, I have a mock net running on my machine and um, I'm uh, waiting for the block. Uh, I mean, is there is there a reason why we shouldn't use like the highest possible integer types for these, or the largest possible integer types? Yeah, the, uh, the burn chain operations use U thirty twos, and that's just because we don't have enough space to represent anything bigger. Mm. Got it. Um, I think <laughs> I think Bitcoin itself might actually use a four byte integer to represent its block height. I guess they don't expect there to ever be more than 4.1 billion of them. Yeah, 10 minutes per block. I'm sure they've run some numbers on how long that takes, right? Okay. All right. Um, did you just move this into the in progress column, Aaron? Yeah. Or yeah, I think this is, yeah, it's just still in progress. Oh, sorry, I think I skipped columns. Okay, I was still here. Um, all right, I've, I've seen a bunch of back and forth on this PR kind of, where, where do we stand right now? Is there like more blocking feedback that needs to be addressed? Um, I know there was some conversation on like requests versus async H1 um, and uh, some changes that we want to maybe either revert or, or make some adjustments to before the mainnet launch. I, I, I skipped some of the details there, so. Yeah, I, I think that the, that the only sort of still open thread is like whether or not to refactor this to use HTTP, like our net HTTP module now or later, right? Is that, I think that's the only open thread still. No, there's a couple more. Um, Mostly just around, but they're mostly just like my new show around um, whether or not it's a good idea to monitor to report metrics for certain things versus other things. Um, but those are imminently solvable. Um, but that bigger point, though, like I, I think I think we're on the same page, though. I think I think the consensus right now is we just don't worry about it at this time, but we just fix it before mainnet. All right. 
So in that case, I would say, Ludo, if you can address whatever the remaining feedback is and maybe open a new issue to track the items that we need to address before minute launch and then close this one out. Sure. Um, so I have one question though, concerning um, Jude's feedback. Um, so Jude, you want to terminate the node if we can't enable the Prometheus server? Um, like, is it really what we want to do? Like, as a user, if, if I'm uh, starting the node with the Prometheus feature enabled, then I, I probably have some kind of alarming going on. And if we allow the node to be spawned without the monitoring, then that can be an issue. Yeah, yeah. If you have Prometheus turned on and you fail to start the Prometheus server, that's grounds for panicking or doing a process exit. Uh, okay. My comment there was more about what happens if the socket itself breaks, like after you begin serving and you get a client and say the client times out. Uh, oh, right okay. now, um, okay. you, you're ex an, an accept can, can cause a, like a call to the syscall okay. accept can cause an abort the way it's written. Yeah, okay, I see. Okay, okay, that's good. Cool. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so it looks like we have a path forward on this one. Whoa, sorry. Yeah, sounds good. Um, okay, so coming back here. So going through the in progress column, um, now that the networking, the P2P PR is merged, Jude, have you been able to make progress on these? Yes, but I need to change the, I need to uh, close and reopen these issues as something else. Um, it turns out there's two, uh, um, fu there's fundamentally two separate concerns being addressed here. Uh, the first of which is the RPC interface for mining and, and generating a block. And that's, in a, that, that's more or less done, it just needs some more testing. The part that, I don't know if you saw the conversation on the blockchain channel, but the much more uh, difficult part of this that needs to be a separate issue is finding an efficient way to represent unconfirmed state in a way that is, is shareable between threads and shareable between stacks chain state instances. Um, I've gone through at least two implementations that were both incorrect because they didn't meet all of those constraints that I listed. Um, that last constraint being particularly thorny, the ability to share between threads. Um, and that's an artifact that's a consequence of the fact that we um, have the networking thread and the uh, relayer thread both having their own handle to the chain state. Uh, what this will mean is we will need to uh, find a way to represent both um, unconfirmed MARF data as well as unconfirmed data into the Clarity DB in the uh, database itself, but in a way that lives outside of a uh, in progress rollbackable transaction, which is the case right now. Um, I don't know yet what that will entail. I'm hoping it's going to be somewhat small, like maybe just adding a column to each field we insert to say whether or not it represents unconfirmed state or not. Um, but it needs to be, um, but the, the way in which we handle unconfirmed state cannot live inside of transactions fundamentally, um, because we need a way to um, share that state between threads that may or may not even otherwise see in flight transactions. So I'll be working on that for the mo most of this week, I think, and I'll open separate issues for this. Yeah, yeah, if you can open the issue and also summarize the discussion on Slack so we have enough context uh, within the issue itself. Um, cool, and I know Aaron, you had mentioned on Slack that like of the two options, you had a slight preference for the first one, and like is, is everyone in agreement on that? I think so, I, I think it's fine. So the, the first option just to rehash is um, one of the consequences of making it so that we process the unconfirmed states um, at most once is that we will have to load and store a serialized MARF try. Um, and that's potentially ON squared time and space complexity um, because that MARF try will keep getting bigger and bigger as more and more things are inserted. But Aaron's point, which I agree with, is that the constant factor there is sufficiently small that it's probably not gonna matter too, too much that it's quadratic it's probably going to be faster than having each chain state try to try to manage its own separate um, batch of unconfirmed state. <clears throat> okay. Um, and then what about 1617? I think Is that's related to progress? that other issue. Um, this is a first, ha a first uh, stab at um, summarizing what I just said. I see. But okay. I can refactor it um, I, now that we have more information. Okay. 
1576 Ludo? Why are we on this one? Um, uh, I saw this morning that the tests are failing for some reason. And so, yeah, um, I think it should be fine. I don't think that the this PR is uh, actually the one failing the test, but uh, I'm just rerunning and, and I, I will assign. Uh, I will tag people when, when, when it's okay. Ready. So not not quite ready for review, but hopefully soon. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then sixteen seventy six. Um, do you just start in this end? How far along are you? Um, just starting on it. Okay. Um, fifteen sixty one. Um, I think that we're like delaying this until after the larger refactor. Okay, I'm gonna move it to the next milestone for now. Have it here. Uh, so I, I started looking at this, and I actually have a question for the team. So, like, for instance. When you look at the new stacks block method, um, it's using the sortition DB, uh, DB <laughs> which doesn't exist at this point. So am I just supposed to stop that or so? And yeah, I think the idea is to just stop that. Um, and uh, if the interface doesn't end up being exactly the same as the interface, um, they end up implementing, then uh, you could force me to make changes. Sounds good. You can just use the burn DB right now because uh, they currently store the same state. Okay. Okay, thank you. So, can I move this to in progress, Ludo, or you haven't actually yes. started working on this? Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, Is is this um, like relative prioritization? Where do you want to do this? At least my sense is that this is not super urgent. Like you want to nah, do it, but maybe this as long as you want. Okay. You can post main that if you wanted. All right. I'm just gonna clear milestone then for now. Um, and then what about this one? Um. So that's not been started yet. Um, but I should finish the uh, unconfirmed uh, state representation before I start that, I think. Okay. Um, all right. Let's look at some of the newer issues. Um, okay, so this is the PR that's in progress. Couple of new clarity issues that came in. Is this mostly just documentation? Um, yeah, I think that that should just be uh, documented. Okay. Um, quick question about this. Should that be a uh, type check error? instead of a runtime error, because we can look at that number in the PAL function and determine if it's a U32. Only, only for a literal. Yes. Um, like, yes, we could do some, some like light runtime style checking on literals if we would like to, um, but that applies to literals kind of across the board. Like we could do that all over the place. Well, wait, can, can we infer the, uh, if you had a function right there, for example, wouldn't you be able to refer the, infer the, uh, the type of that function and say, no, this doesn't type check? Uh, no, because we don't have a, we don't have a U32 type. Oh, got it. Right, we only have two integer types. If we had more integer types, then yes, that would be uh, possible. Um, but we would also have to have like some sort of, we would probably have to have some sort of like type calculus for our arithmetic in the first place. Got it. 
quick question yeah. concerning that. So I think at some point we discussed the idea of introducing uh, uint to buff, which would, I guess, require some kind of few weight. Or like, what would be the plan for, like, if we want to, yeah, be able to convert um, integer to buff or vice versa? Um. I'm not sure, like, um, I guess I think that there's, I think that there's like, yeah, I don't know. I would have to think about it because we could also convert U128 to BOPS. Yeah. It's right. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I would have to think about it. OK, moving on here. I asked Tari if he's interested in submitting a documentation PR, so we'll see um, what he says. Um, this one, I think, I think it's safe to ignore. I can just submit it as not relevant for this repo. It's probably like our bug bounties are attracting uh, some types of submissions that are not relevant. Not to say that this might not be a, a real issue, but. Um, I don't think it's relevant for this repository, so I'm going to close this out. I think maybe uh, Hacker One might be interested in this. Oh, yeah, that? yeah. Hacker One. That, that's what I, there was another issue that I already closed, and I, that's what I said in that issue that should submit to a Hacker One. Um, yeah. uh, okay, Hank had this feature request. I think Jude, you had a follow up comment. Have, has everyone had a chance to look through this? I think I did quickly, yeah. Okay, so what do we what do we think is a good next step here? Well, the uh, it wasn't clear to me what he was asking for because I could interpret this in two ways. Uh, first, you could be asking for what's essentially a Clarity debugger, so you can see what uh, you could step through Clarity functions and see that you know the following values get stored over the execution of this contract. Or he's asking for the ability to paginate through maps, um, which is something I think the sidecar will want at some point. Um, what in order to address the pagination problem, um, I think we decided a long time ago that the we were not going to spend time trying to make morphed data um, paginatable or iterable, um, but it should be possible to do something like build up the equivalent of an asset map, but for um, diff but for like the seek the set of inserts and deletes to a map that have happened over the execution of a transaction and we could potentially return that as part of the receipt so that way the sidecar can just apply the sequence of diffs to get the uh, current um, iterable view of the map but i yeah. don't think trying to stream back each and every mutation that happens as a separate event is a good idea yeah i mean ultimately that is pretty similar to what the event stream would be, right? Like we would take out, like rather than taking the asset map out of the key value wrapper, we would just take the edit log at the end. And right. we could stream that out um, or whatever, emit it as an event. It's certainly doable, but I think it would, this would need to be like sort of a default off option, like way more default off than the current events are. Um, yeah. because yeah, I think that there, there's a good argument to be made that like developers can choose what events they want explorers to be concerned with, but like all mutations whatsoever, it's just, it's a lot. Um, is, is something like this, um, Algorand might be interested in, Aaron, because presumably like, they also need access to similar information and they're also relying on David right so theory, right? what they're doing is taking they, they might be interested in the interface yeah i could see that because like what they're doing is like essentially what we just described which yeah. is like they're they're just trying to take the edit log out of the rollback wrapper um, okay yeah so maybe if they had an interface where they were just subscribing to events maybe Maybe that would be preferable to them. Yeah. Or maybe they can even take a stab at implementing this. Yes. Like this. Yeah. OK. 
Okay, um, Ludo, any any thoughts from your your end? Um, not really. Um, uh, I'm having. I, I don't really see the downside. Uh, like if we went, if we did it for for the for the tokens, fungible and non fungible, we could do this for the maps and, and the Tava. Um, I don't have a strong opinion. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to take an action item to. Um, sorry, I'm just jotting down in my notes. So I will check in with Algorand on this, and then tomorrow we can discuss with the DevX team on how important this is from their end. To help us prioritize. I, I think at some point we did discuss about introducing some kind of um, um, so the ability to uh, emit an event uh, like an arbitrary event, and I think that if we introduce that, then we we no longer need that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, okay. Cool. Wait. Sorry. Was that this an issue for um, for emitting an arbitrary event? And and if we implement this, we don't need that. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Because as a developer, you would be, I think, like uh, emitting an event. Um, with yeah. all the data that you want to extract. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, like if I if I'm right, I'm thinking about BNS, for instance. Uh, I think I'd rather uh, create a clean event uh, with all the data field that. I want to emit versus, uh, like, like the, if you look at the BNS yeah. uh, modelization, you have one map for the um, for the zone file, and then an, an, another map for all the metadata things. Um, yeah, no, that that totally makes sense to me. I and I, I agree. I, I think that developers probably want to be able to emit, emit their own events rather than rely on just events for data mutations. Um, yeah. I thought you were arguing the uh, the opposite for a second. We have that already though, right? Yeah, that's implemented through print. Yeah. But, but it's a bit different, right? Because uh, the events I'm describing are uh, returning multiple fields. Yeah. They're more structured. They are structured and, and typed. Uh, yeah. Um, but like presumably you could do that with that tuple, right? Uh, but the, the print, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, you could do that with the tuple, but the print is expecting a buffer, I think. Mm. I thought print took an any type. Oh, OK, OK, maybe. But it might not. We can double check. All right. So what's the conclusion here? If you already have the capability to emit arbitrary events, like do we need anything special here? I think that this is probably, as Hank says, this is still useful as a DX tool. Hmm. Like you could imagine like running a VM and it is emitting like debug events to your as a debugger, basically. Mm -hmm. um, okay. All right, we can discuss more with the DevX team tomorrow. Yeah. All right, coming down the list here. This is uh, just a flaky test. Do we know kind of what's happening here? It's a timing issue. I just need to look more into it. Okay, should I assign this to you, Jude? Please do. Um, 
All right, this is uh, the issue with faucet transactions showing up as pending indefinitely. Um, Aaron, you said that we don't have enough, um, or we at that point had not, did not have enough data on the sidecar to confirm this. Yeah, so the, the issue is that nobody is storing the raw transactions that get ejected. Mm. So like when, it, if a transaction gets ejected for this reason, there's no information anywhere about oh, the previous transaction. Um, and the sidecar doesn't store, like when it parses out a transaction after it receives the event, like it doesn't store the nonce, which is kind of the, the field that you would need to confirm that this is happening. Mm -hmm. um, but in, regardless of whether or not this was like causing the issue that we were seeing, yeah. Um, I think this is a bug that exists in the code. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So it sounds like we should just fix this, right? Who wants Who wants to take it? Uh, I can. Oh. <laughs> I can take it, but um, I would say this is like code that is like highly likely to change multiple mm. times in the next couple couple weeks like yeah i would say this is probably code that's going to change in choose mining pr mm. actually i don't think it will uh, the mining oh, okay. pr doesn't really touch the mempool okay then i take it back <laughs> let's just i i would say let's just fix this and then yeah i think uh, it should be a pretty easy fix so all right and then it seems like we almost should open another issue to catch or like make it easier to debug this type of bug in the future. Like if transactions are rejected from the mempool for whatever reason, and we have no like logging or visibility around them, there might be like other causes for that. Um, so what can we do like on the Stacks blockchain side to create uh, visibility? And then if there's anything that needs to happen, happen on the sidecar side, we should flag it to the DevX team tomorrow. Yeah. We can um, just log the raw transaction if it's rejected. Yeah, or whenever it, like whenever you do a mempool admission, we can just log the raw transaction. And then we'll have like a log entry for these transactions, regardless of whether or not we get, we'll end up replacing them. Like we'd be able to find previous transactions. That's just generally good to have too, because then you can yeah. replay transaction histories. Um, and is there anything we would want on the sidecar side, like in addition to us logging the, the raw transactions when rejected? Yeah, um, on the sidecar side, they do, um, when they get a mempool transaction event, they parse the transaction. Um, and so there's maybe two things that would be useful. So one is they should store the account nonce um, that broadcasted the transaction. Um, like there's a bunch of like fields related to like who signed it, what did they sign it with, like what nonce did they use? That stuff should be stored in the mempool uh, database that they manage. And then the other thing that they can do, which might be useful, is just store the raw transaction. So like right now they just store the parsed transaction, but like they can also stop to store the raw one. Um, mm -hmm. That, that could also just be useful for explorers. Yeah. Because like usually on an explorer, you, you can see the raw transaction. Okay. All right. We can bring this up tomorrow as well. All right. Um, has anyone had a chance to look through this? I think we, we've discussed this a few times now. Um, I haven't taken a deep look at it, but I think that this is a, yeah, this is an issue that we should address. Um, I can try to address it in the same PR. I think okay. if there's kind of like an easy address, um, which is like, yeah, we just look to see if we have a transaction with the prior nonce in the mempool. And if so, we accept and maybe we accept up to some limit, like three or four. Yeah. Um, in general, 
like uh, I think Matt made a comment on Slack that there's you know there's a mis a bunch of miscellaneous issues that might indicate uh, just like some gaps in our non handling. Like is that a shared? Believe here, are we aware of like any code paths that are like not well tested or unclear behaviors? Like this is another one that he had mentioned. I don't know if you. Um. I don't think we ever fully resolved this one. Yeah, anyways, so, so coming back to non-handling, how are we feeling overall about that? Um, I feel pretty okay about it. Like neither 1686 or the prior issue were like that surprising to me. The, the issue that um, uh, Freaker raised uh, is surprising to me, but uh, probably indicates that his node went through a reorg. Mm. It's also possible the key he's using to sign the transaction was also used um, to mine blocks because the nonce gets incremented with a coin base. I see. Um, it would, like a lot of the issues that uh, DevX and also Frieger shows don't have enough information really for me to figure out exactly why it's happening. Like it would be nice if they posted the, like a mempool dump or something whenever they submitted the transaction as well as showing what the transaction, the raw transaction was. How can we make it easy for people to get and, and submit that information. I think like in a lot of these cases, people are depending on us to tell them like what information we need. Like it's not going to be obvious to, to someone who's not familiar with the internals of the system that exactly what information they need to provide. So to the extent that we can make it easy, like if you have a script that people can run on their local node that captures, you know, relevant builds into a bits into a zip file, whether it's logs or databases or whatever else. Should they post maybe the transaction directly to the master node? So that we know that we have the logs, we know the setup, uh, we um, can't. Uh, yeah, I, I suspect that that would, that that would help, but it would also perhaps mask some issues. Like if the reason that people are getting like experiencing weird transaction behavior is that there's like some sort of failure in propagation of the mempool. Like that's a bug that we want to figure out exists and address. Um, by everybody posting their transactions to the same node, we will miss that. Um, so I think maybe something like a script that just like zips up their temporary node directory if they're running a node be helpful because I mean, that that should contain all the information basically. Like maybe they could, uh, if, what if they did the following, like submit transaction, transaction fails, then very quickly run the script afterwards or maybe use the script to actually send the transaction that if it fails, we'll just dump the mempool. It'll do the SQL query and print it out for us. And then send us that transcript. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if there's a script in the in the code base, and we can include the instructions in our bug templates, so whenever people are submitting an issue, they can just see the instructions right there on how to get the information. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay, um, 1683, I guess this is just the PR that Aaron had, we already talked through this. Um, 1680, I think this was a refinement of the socket timer discussion we had last week. Yep. Um, I can take that, I, I can even just merge it in as part of another PR, it's literally like a one line change. Okay, yeah, let's just do it then. 
maybe two lines, but it's tiny. Okay. And then we went through this one. I think the remaining we discussed last time. Or maybe not. Does anyone remember the discussion? Sorry, I should be updating these issues. I think I remember we discussed it, but I don't recall the conclusion. Yeah. Um, so as Max Link correctly takes a UINT, um, the length for Lisp type definitions. Um, so when you do a list, list type definition, you have to supply an integer rather than a UINT. Um, this is, uh, creates some dissonance, but, um, I think the least disruptive way to do this would be in the same PR as type inference. Cause like mm -hmm. type inference kind of turns this into a non-issue. Yeah. Uh, not type inference, uh, integer literal inference turns this into a non-issue. Um, but we're not working on that PR, right? We're saying if someone wishes to tackle yes. that PR. <laughs> yeah, tackle yeah. That PR. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that the integer int integer literal inference ultimately is going to be complex enough that I would be pretty surprised if somebody tackled it. Yeah. Like, uh, Terrier seems fairly confident, but uh, I don't know. So until then, like if we're not, if you know, if we're not committing to working on that ourselves, um, should I just say yes, you know, we understand this is a uh, and we can clarify the documentation, but that's kind of, that's all we can do for now. Yeah, I think so. Uh, like, I'm not going to open a PR that addresses this um, yeah. until there's the literal type inference. So, I don't know how I feel about it. I mentioned it in that 1683 PR as part of like a giant bucket of yeah. breaking changes for clarity. Probably comment on this. Honorability prioritizes it separately. All right. And we talked about this as well. I think we're with Ludo's PR request should already be gone, right? From at least the dev dependencies. Uh, yes, well. is going, but uh, I think which one is. Uh, so we can uh, replace with sure. <laughs> well, maybe we need like a, a yeah we can we can just update to say you know all uh, non dev HTTP use cases should use our net HTTP implementation something like that right yeah yeah should I just edit this to reflect that sounds good. All right, I think this covers most of the issues. Let's look through this here. Okay, we only have uh, 
less than 10 minutes or maybe five minutes left. Um, so, so we can keep this brief and maybe we can come back to this on Wednesday, unless there are other items for discussion for the architecture meeting. So, um, yeah, where are we on the refactoring? I mean, it seems like we're working to implement some of the changes that we discussed and it's a plan to kind of take us, you know, do a checkpoint at some point to see where we stand, whether we want to continue with the refactoring path or, or roll it back. Like what is the next step there? Um, I think we should plan to do a check-in at the end of this week or at the start of next week. So like maybe this meeting next week, we should okay. do a check-in um, and see how we're doing progress-wise. And if we're not making progress on it, I think we should try to figure out why that is. Um, yeah. I'm okay. not confident I'll be making much progress on my part of the refactory because I still have to figure out the unconfirmed state representation. Yeah, that's that's fine. I think if that's if that's the case, then um, we'll, yeah, we can uh, we can try to sort it out next week, I guess. Because like if yeah. Ludo and I have made a bunch of progress on our um, issues, then we we might just like take the uh, the other one off Jude's plate if he hasn't. Yeah. Like, if you're well, still like, backlogged. Me, yeah, but that still doesn't answer the question whether we're committing to to this refactoring. At least my yeah. my recollection of the discussion is we want to uh, you know make some progress on the refactoring and then make like a decision on whether we want to continue going down this path uh, mm -hmm. or not. Uh, right now, it sounds like that you know we want to make progress here, but we don't, or at least I'm not hearing like a clear decision point unless a decision has already been made. Um, which is also fine. I just, I, I just want to clarify kind of where we are. I think we've already decided to do it. I think that the oh, okay. is, is a necessary but not sufficient step to implementing POX. Okay, I, I think that makes sense, and and that at least it's good to just state it out loud and and make sure everyone's on the same page. So, so if that's the case, um, um, then I would like to like start to flesh out you know, what are, let's say we do the refactoring, like what are the other big remaining work items and, and try to like start sequencing them a little bit um, just so that we can plan and create some estimation around how long would it take uh, for a POX implementation to, to finalize and then be done. So uh, maybe uh, we can use the Wednesday meeting to do that. Um, if not, um, then, then I can find some, some extra time for us. Okay, any other topics Let's want to discuss? Sounds like not. All right, in that case, happy Monday, everyone. And um, yeah, let's uh, follow up offline uh, or on Slack on just coordinating the, the chain reset. All right, take care.